Welcome to Stories of Hope. I'm Christine Hotchkiss. Each week I bring you stories of inspiration, education, and my one big word of all is to give hope. I want to thank my studio sponsor, The Motivated Mind Group, a global creative agency located right here in downtown Chandler. Okay, my guest today is PJ. He's an international speaker and resilient expert. We're going to figure out what that's all about. Teaching people to embrace and live the resilience way. Despite his disability, which was expected to take his life by seven, he chose to live and live it well. His quote unquote disability isn't a disability, but rather a different ability. Please help me welcome my guest today, PJ. Hello, hello, beautiful people. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks, Hi, Christine, PJ. for the opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate your time and um, resilience. But, you know, there's a couple things I wrote in here because we do, we do resist a lot of things in life. But disability, I was corrected a while back that when people have a disability, whether it's physical, emotional, whatever the disability is, it's not a disability. It's a different ability. <laughs> and having looked at your bio, you have done a lot of things. And yep. so now you get to tell us what your disability is. <laughs> um, listen, I don't care what people call me. I don't care how they define me. Able-bodied, disabled, differently abled, it doesn't matter. What matters to me is that um, I live in a way that inspires other people. So I have a very rare form of muscular dystrophy that was expected to take my life by seven. I turned 53 this year. And so I'd say either I've got something good to do or God's pissed and he's making me work off some karma. <laughs> it might be the case. Um, but hopefully, hopefully my intention is, not, not hopefully, my intention is to inspire people to live a better life. And I do that through helping people understand more about their own innate resilience. And I laugh because we've already spoken. You have a funny bone about it. Because if we do take everything serious, then we're really not enjoying and living life, right? Right, absolutely. Why wouldn't you want to enjoy your life? We're here. You might as well enjoy it. It's a choice. And since we have a choice, we can either choose to be unhappy or we can choose to be happy. In um, 19, no, 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 that's going back too far. In 2017, uh, 2019, sorry, um, I got some kind of virus and lost like 85% of my physical strength. And I mean, I literally, I couldn't roll out of bed. When I was able to roll out of bed, I struggled to be able to sit up. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't hardly move at all. I couldn't have a sheet on me because if I did get the chance to roll over, I couldn't roll over back because the weight of the sheet was um, so overwhelming for me. I just was that physically weak. At one point, my friend said, PJ, you need 24 hours of care. And it just smacked me right in the face like a shovel because I didn't want to see that. I didn't want to accept that. And so I've fortunately been able to work my way um, back down to about an hour and a half to two hours of a support in the morning, but that's it. But the reason I tell you that is because about nine months after getting sick, <clears throat> I was out to lunch with a couple of my friends and they're like, you've lost so much of your physical strength and your own abilities. How is it that you're still happy? And I said, I can choose to be sad and hurt and scared and worried and disappointed and upset and angry and all of those things. Or I can choose to be hopeful and excited and filled with possibilities still and creativity still and resilience still. Or, you know, I can go negative or I can go positive. And if it's a choice, you know, I would rather choose to be positive because you can feel bad, but feeling bad feels bad. Or I can choose to feel good and feeling good feels good. It's an easy choice for me. It absolutely does. And you know what? There are a lot of people, and even if we think positive every day, we have to go through different emotions where we're waking up and going, no, oh, I just don't feel it today. You know, stay <laughs> under the covers, right? <laughs> so, PJ, I looked at some of your stuff here, mm -hmm. and, and then we're going to go back to the age seven thing because that really captured my attention. But sure. in the stuff that you sent to me, this is interesting because you just mentioned how, first of all, are you in a wheelchair, if I remember correctly? Yeah. You see, if I lean over, you can see the wheelchair right yes, there. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, it's yes. a manual wheelchair. I gave up my electric wheelchair in college. And despite the lack of physical strength now, I still refuse to use an electric wheelchair. As long as I can possibly push, I will. 
Holy cow, that totally goes with the resilience way. <laughs> You're making a whole different thing here. I love it. I love that you have the strength within your mind, not always with your body, as you'd already mentioned. But here's a couple of things that, you know, we, we can say, oh, I can't do that. And one of the things, and if my son was sitting right here, he'd say the same thing. He's like, don't tell my mom that. I can't tell my mom that. And it was this. I, I told both my daughter and my son. When they say, I can't do that, I was like, did you try? Because can't isn't an option if you haven't tried. Now, within reason, of course. But it was like, if you can't say, if you can say that I can't, that means you didn't try it. So don't ever say that. So they don't say it. <laughs> There's a lot of things I was a different I, type of I was of raised parent. in the same way. My mom did the same thing for me, <clears throat> for me and my sister. She would say, can't doesn't live here. Can't never oh. did a thing. Keep trying. Right. And so we would get praised for trying, which is why I think my sister and I have succeeded at the level that we have. Positive reinforcement, right? Yeah, yes. At least I think it is. Okay, so here's a couple of things that I just thought, wow, I know that you're in a wheelchair. Now I know even more about your physical ability and your strength in your mind <coughs> is much more, but you keep working with both because you said you already gave up the electric wheelchair. But you've got stuff in here you've done like, you ready for this? I mean, we're talking extraordinary stuff. Sailing, mm -hmm. skydiving, yeah. um, trapezing. Yes. Uh, zip lining, one of my favorite things to do. Super fun, I, right? It is, it is. I did it a, a couple different times. Um, hiking, mountain climbing, and snow skiing. All right, yeah. now, you're a perfect example of tell people who say they can't do something or they have a disability. How do you, how do, you do all that, PJ? you just get creative, right? I can't even lift my own arms anymore. I can barely stop my own wheelchair. And so if there's something you want, you just find a way. So for example, hiking, I don't hike. I get strapped to the back of a friend and we go, right? Or I used to just hold on piggyback style and they would reach underneath my uh, my legs. I'd be on their back. They'd reach under my legs and reach up and grab my own wrists. So I basically became a ba uh, backpack. And when I jump out of planes, uh, for me, when I jump out of planes, it's not like other people getting jump, uh, jumping out of planes. I'm strapped to the front of a great big guy. So it's a little bit like being kidnapped because if I don't want to get out, I'm still getting out. Um, and in fact, that was a great experience the first time I did that. Um, and I can tell you that story if you're interested, but how do I do it? I do it because I find creative ways. You know, I still want the experience. If that means that I have to be strapped to the back or the front of someone to do it, I will. You know, but snow skiing, I just, I sit in what's called a bi-ski, which is like a little seat for your bum. And there's a little cup out in front of you for your feet. And then below me, about 14 inches, to 16 inches below are two skis. And um, often people will use outriggers, which are the metal crutches that you see, but with little skis on the bottom, but I don't have the hands and the arms for that. So mm -hmm. I just th stick my thumbs inside of the seat where I'm sitting and I lean into the, like I lean forward into the, uh, into the turn and I sit back and then I diagonally lean forward into the next turn and I sit back. And there is somebody that's called a tetherer. They're following me down with a, a rope on the back in case I get out of control. But um, fortunately- You get uh, out of control? If I get out of control, yeah, if I get out of control. <laughs> Fortunately, um, I'm a good enough skier, or at least I was the last time I skied. I haven't skied since I got sick. Um, but fortunately, I'm a good enough skier that they don't have to keep the line taut. So they just ski, basically ski with me. All right, PJ, you know that phrase, if you want to do it, you'll find a way. And uh, you just said in all these different instances that you found a way, and you didn't have to physically be the person, but you also have a team of people who are like, yeah, we're there for you too to enjoy the experience. I'm sorry that you're gonna sit on the sidelines and watch everyone else have fun. You're like, no, that ain't happening. <laughs> well, listen, I'm, I'm actually talking to some friends about going to Machu Picchu. And oh, if you've I ever been, been to Machu Picchu, no, I haven't it's on my checklist. Either. Yeah, oh. me too, for sure, for sure. Um, but uh, Machu Picchu is a, quite a hike. And so I know that for me to do something like that, like climbing in the Grand Canyon, I have to go with multiple friends so they can, you know, share the burden. I get piggybacked on one person for a little while, piggybacked on the next person for a little while. And, you know, they they just pass me around. Um, and so I'm very fortunate. I have some amazing friends. In fact, right before we jumped on this call, I got a text message from a friend of mine that said, how much do you weigh? Because I think he's putting together some kind of new um, backpack uh oh, for us wow. to, uh, to be able to hike and you know climb a little bit together so i'm pretty yeah. excited that is incredible and you also have to think about this too 
they don't have to go to the gym. They've got you. <laughs> they carry you around. Right. If you ever saw um, <laughs> Empire Strikes Back with uh, Yoda on their back, uh, I teach martial arts. And there have been times where I've had my, uh, my friends or my students put me on their back and then do the technique. One, so I can feel it, but also so I can say, oh, here's the problem. This is what you're doing. Right. And they're like, oh, really? You could feel that? Yeah. And so um, being able to feel it gives me the ability to have some insight for uh, my student or my friend that I might be giving some advice to. So now you already mentioned that your um, strength of your body is different than someone of my own. How sure, sure. do you maneuver around? Um, if you see me squirming and rocking back and forth, uh, there's a serious curvature in my spine. So for anybody who can't see me, with, and nobody can see me from the waist down, right, or from the mid-chest down right now, but my belly button is literally on the seat between my thighs. So think about leaning so far forward. You have to okay. open up your knees. Lean so far forward that your belly button is touching the seat. Then curve your back up, right, so that your shoulders and neck and head are upright. And that's what I look like. My belly button right now as I'm looking at you is literally touching the seat between my thighs. And that's how I sit. So then for me to move, since I don't have much arm strength, I have to rock my body. And as I rock my body, I fling my arm. And as I fling my arm, I get my forearm on it. And then because I can't do my hands anymore, so I get my forearm on my push rim. And then I lean forward. And as I lean forward, I push my weight um, into the wheel. And so I let my body rock me forward and I push. Then I come back, swing arm back, lean forward, push again. Same thing with, uh, you know, left side or right side. And then when it comes to stopping, I'm not a good stopper anymore. So I have to find creative ways to do that. Often just jam jamming my elbow into the wheel. I just don't okay. quit. Christine, the truth is I just don't want to quit. That. I want to live. You know, I want to live another 100 years at least. And my neighbor jokes. He's like, yeah, you know, you'll probably still be alive in a thousand years. I hope so. <laughs> because I want to live like, and that, that's what I want when I work with my clients or when I speak from stage, <clears throat> I want people to realize that you can love your life. I want people to love their life so much that they really, when, they, when they're on their deathbed, they're like, this was so fun, I'm not done yet. I'm not ready to go. I want people to truly do the things in their life that they were born to do. And I don't mean career wise, I want that for them too. But I mean, what is calling to your heart? What is calling to your spirit? What excites you about life? Is it food? Is it hiking? Is it nature? Is it art? What is it for you? What moves you? Because the happier you are, the happier you can, the more happiness you can share. If you don't have happiness, if you don't have joy, if you don't have inspiration, if you don't have courage, if you don't have compassion, you can't share those. And yet we all know that those are delicious parts of who we are as people. Yeah, got me right in the heart on all of those. Absolutely. And as you know, um, it is a choice, but no one is exempt from any changes either. So one day we could be walking just fine, have our eyesight, be able to speak, and then, then one day something might change. Listen, let me, let me jump in real, forgive me for interrupting, but this yeah. is an important thing that you're saying. Change, I always said that change is inevitable. Transformation is a choice. Oh, yeah. So you're 100% right. Change is going to happen, whether we like it or not. I don't like that I'm weaker at all, right? However, I get to transform how I think about that so that I can still continue to live my life. So mm -hmm. if there's only two kinds of people in the world, there are free people and there are slaves. Eek, I know that I'm being a little provocative here, right? <laughs> But free people are people that respond, right? They have they um, they choose to respond to the circumstances of their life. Um, and a slave is somebody who reacts. A reaction is a slave action. And so, if I'm in that state where I say, "Oh, this is this is terrible. My life is the worst. I can't believe this is happening to me. Ugh, life is just terrible. Why can't I have a good life like everybody else?" You're in reaction mode. You're in slavery. That's why it hurts. Because the reason you're in agony is because you are at war with yourself. Part of you wants to continue living. The other part is struggling. And so I really, truly believe that when you shift away from that reaction mindset into a space of responsibility, you're, you become aware, right? I believe that there's, three, there's a three-step process that your brain goes through virtually every second of every day. Awareness for lack of awareness, responsibility or reaction, and then the technique or the action that you take. So ART, 
right? Awareness, responsibility, and technique. What is that technique that you're going to implement? And then are you aware of how it's turning out and what's your responsibility to continue to refine and shift that? And what's the technique to do that? You're constantly going through this process, ART, art. Why? Because you're creating your art, your life. You are the creator of your life. No one else, no matter what the circumstances are, you might have to deal with that, but that doesn't mean that you have to react to that. You get to respond in a way that creates the outcome that you want. No matter what that outcome um, is demanding of you, you can have it provided you're willing to put forth the energy and the effort and the commitment. Because 100%. resilience is born from commitment. 100%. So we're going to bring this back a few years only because as an adult, society tries to program us. I say try because now as I've gone through my own stuff, we mm -hmm. allow it to program yes. us, whether it's comparison or what has happened to our lives. That's why I say it the way that I do. I always look at kids as resilient, right? Yes. We were all kids at one time, but then yeah. society gets a hold of us at some age or at some point and changes that. Yes. Where there's fear and then we're thinking, I can't do this, you know, all mm. the negatives that come with it. And sometimes it's our household or it's our environment, so I can't say it's one thing because that would not be fair, a uh, fair statement. But you had mentioned in the very beginning that seven years old, you weren't expected to have life expectancy after seven, and here you just mentioned you are gonna be 53. As a kid, how did you feel knowing that you had muscular dystrophy, aware of it, a, a form where kids can be really mean at the same time, they can be resilient when it comes to disabilities because we're different. That's mm -hmm. why I've changed it to being, it's not a disability, it's a different ability. So as a kid, how were you able to get along with other kids? Did you struggle with that? I didn't, I'm always, I've been very, very fortunate. I've had amazing friends my entire life. The most difficult years were seventh and eighth grade, but that's puberty right? 12 and 13 is difficult for everybody. But I didn't really struggle with that. I've always, always had amazing friends. People have always looked past my disability because I looked past my disability. There are times when my friends would get out of the car and start to walk into wherever we were going. They'd stop and come back, take my chair out of the trunk, open the door and be like, sorry, dude, I forgot you're in a chair. I looked back and wondered where you were. <laughs> and that's because I don't think about it. If I don't think about it, you don't think about it. You're absolutely right. If I don't right. give attention to it, <clears throat> then you don't give attention to it because you just see me as who I am. There's a great yeah. scene in the movie Man Without a Face. I think it's called Man Without a Face. Mel Gibson, right? Mel Gibson has the right side of his face has been burned in a car accident. And he's got a, a student, like he's, not, he's a math tutor <clears throat> in this particular situation. And the boy, his, his student is in the car with him. And they're driving and the boy's staring at the mask on, or the, the burn on his face. And Mel Gibson starts to get a little nervous and a little self-conscious, and he, he looks over. He looks over at the boy, right, and he's like, "What? What are you? What are you looking? What are you looking at?" Right, because he's starting to get nervous. Like this boy is is staring at the scar, and the boy says, "When I look at you, I don't see your scars." Oh. That's a beautiful statement. He's saying, "I see your heart," and when you're when you are a good soul, a good person, right, when you care about others, and you don't put attention into the sad parts of your life or the difficult parts of your life or your losses, but instead you put it into the hope, stories of hope. You put it into the hope for the future. You put it into the art that you're creating the way that you want your life to be. When you put your attention into the friendships and the connections <clears throat> with yourself for something greater, then all of a sudden life starts to blossom. It's just you know, like I wanna, a I wanna add to that because this is something that I see and I pay attention to people probably more than I should, but I just go, interesting, what's their story? Obviously, because that's just what I have going on here because it helps other people. But the one thing I have noted, so not a lot of people know this, but I was born blind and deaf. That is um, so crazy. I think you told me this. Tell me again. Yeah, I was. For a short time of my life, I was blind and deaf because of a situation, and we won't get into that, but I wanted to share that. So I don't take any of my visual or any of my hearing ever for granted. That's why I'm yeah. always like looking at the small things when people are like, oh, it's the small things. I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> wow. but, but with that being said, there are people who are born blind and stay blind. There are people that lose their eyesight for one reason or another. But it, wouldn't it be neat, and we know this is impossible, okay. wouldn't it be neat if we didn't have the ability to judge with our eyes that we didn't have eyes to see one another? 
How would we get along? We couldn't find the differences in us. We wouldn't even know that someone has a different ability versus mm -hmm. someone who has, you know, whatever else that's going on in their life. Wouldn't that be just like the, the neatest mindset that we could put into this world? I know, like I said, it's not possible, yeah. but that, I always think that. Of course, absolutely. Any opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, any opportunity where we're able to let go of the differences and embrace the, the differences that um, would cause us to repel against each other, but instead to embrace the, uh, the character and the quality and the value that we bring or that others bring to us, that would be delicious. I think right. that's always one of the most beautiful things is to recognize somebody for who they really are. And being blind, just because you, you lack eyesight doesn't mean you lack vision. Ah, oh, that was good. That was very good. Thank you. Yeah, so tell yeah. me a little bit more about what it is um, being an international speaker mm -hmm. and a resilience expert. I mean, we've talked about your personal yeah. resilience. Tell me how you actually go out to the community or groups. What do you share with them? What is the message you give them and want them to walk away with? I talk about the, what I call the resilient way, the three keys for turning any obstacle into an opportunity. And so for me, it's really important that people have the opportunity to build the life that they really want. And since I believe that resilience is born from commitment, then you have to actually get committed. But before you get committed, you have to let go. You know as well as I do that there are some amazing forces out there, some really, really uh, well-known and renowned people that say, you've got to know your why. You've got to have your why. Your mm -hmm. why is what's going to drive you. And that's great. And I believe in that. And I agree with that. But the problem is, if you have your why, you already have it. But if you don't have your why, you're like, oh, I'm searching and trying to figure out my why. There's nothing that's so drastic in your life that it's creating this why that drives you forward so instead of trying to find your why and struggling 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 why don't you look at the anchor that's holding you back mm -hmm. so for me my very first step in actually becoming resilient for people is let go and i always say let that stuff go right because in your mind your unconscious mind there's i make a clear distinction between your conscious and your unconscious the unconscious is going to constantly bring up some of the negativities and some of the fears and some of the worries and some of the doubts and some of the what ifs. Why does it do that? Because believe it or not, it's actually your best friend. It's trying to say, hey, what if you do this and you fail? Then, you know, you might not want to go through with this. So what, and that, and that could hurt and that could be embarrassing. So let's not do that. Um, and so it wants to hold you back. But what I think, and I, I, when I say you, I mean you, the conscious you, but when I say it, I mean your unconscious mind. So often we just want to say, shh, it because <laughs> sometimes that's all it's giving us right so that's why i say let that sh go okay right, right right and then the second stage is once you've let it go because picture this there's a giant anchor behind you that anchor is dug deep into the ground a big ship anchor dug deep into the ground and that ship anchor is your past you can't change it. it's stuck it's there you can't do anything about your past however it's not the anchor that's the problem it's the attachment you have to it the ropes mm -hmm. and the chains that bind you so as you move forward, you're going to be pulled back, especially if you see something you want, you start to run towards it. And then all of a sudden you get jerked into the past because the doors to your future, the doors to your remarkable future are in the past. So when you get pulled off of your feet because you're trying to move forward and all of a sudden you get pulled back by something in your past, you can't seem to let it go. Don't think about the past. Think about how it's attached to you and how you let it be tied into your thoughts or your heart or your body. How can you release that and let that go? Because the moment you let that chain go is the moment you untie that rope from your heart or your mind or your, any part of your body. As soon as you untie that, you can set it down and then you can move forward again. So it's not about finding a bigger why because that feels like I have to climb a mountain. It's just about stopping and going, what's actually holding me back? So the very first step to becoming or living the resilient way is let that stuff go. So, and then the next is commit. Right? Commit fully. And I shouldn't have to say fully, but most people commit partially. Think about this. If there's anything in your life that's not working out 100%, I'd be willing to bet that it's not working out 100% because you're not putting 100% commitment into it. But when we put 100% commitment into something, it's amazing and remarkable how things start to evolve and grow and take on a life of their own. And the world and the universe starts to feed to you what it is that you need and what you want. Even though there might be an uphill climb, if you commit fully, that resilience that you need to get you there will be born because when you commit, 
resilience is born. So step one is let that stuff go. Step two is commit fully. Step three is get excited about your problem. Get excited about your your next challenge. I did say problem, but most of the time I say challenge because I don't want you to think about your problems. I don't want you to think about your issues. I want you to see something maybe as a challenge. And a challenge is something that we get to wrestle with. It's something that we get to play against. It's something that we get to climb up and over. A challenge is something that just strengthens us. And so if we get excited about our challenge, it releases the dopamine in our brain, in our body, and that dopamine, while we think is uh, is tied and linked to feeling good, it is, but it's more associated with motivation and that internal drive to get you in motion. So when you get excited, if you're sitting on the couch and you're like, oh, I'm in couch potato mode, I need to do this stuff, I can't, oh, well, you know, I can't do it. Why? Because you feel like you're overwhelmed by certain chemicals in your brain, but the moment you get excited, all of a sudden you have this energy and you can get up off the couch. There's hey, that motivation. BJ. I get excited. <laughs> you're super excited. <laughs> and I love it. You know, that also, when you speak about it, I think when people come to these seminars or they go to speak, or to listen to a speaker on whatever the experience or the expertise is, I think a lot of us will go in depending on where we are in our lives. So if we're going to like figure out who we are as a person, you already talked about the why part. It's like, but the why doesn't have to be just your professional life. The why could be your personal side too. It's a push and a pull on both things. And like you already said, if you're going to be resilient on something that you say you got this idea or you have this dream, you have this feeling you want, but if you don't keep pushing forward and let that anchor pull you back, you're never going to find the professional part of your why or the personal part of your why, whether it's to have a business of your own or to have a relationship with someone or a family or, or whatever whatever those things are, it, it goes both ways. It's the resilience of stop letting that anchor pull you back, like you said, and lean into, I think is the right way, into what it is that you're wanting and take everything that you've been pulled back as a lesson, what not to do or what to to maybe fix, to move forward, to go towards what you're trying to lean into. Am I right? 100%, absolutely. Oh, good. So before I ask my final question, where can you be found should anyone want to know more about you or perhaps book you as a speaker? That would be amazing. Um, I would just send most people to pjswisdom.com, pjswisdom.com, because there you can find links to all of the social media sites that I have. Um, and I would love to be able to, and you can also send me an email from there. I'd love to connect with people and, um, just tell me how I can serve you and be of support because I want you to have an amazing life. And the way you do that is by letting go of the things that are holding you back. So take that next step. Something that is very difficult for us. It's easier to hear. What's that saying? It's easier said than done, but I'm not believing that anymore because, uh, to be done means you took the action, the initiative to do it yeah. because it really meant that much to you if you wanted to if you want it you'll find a way to do it 100 so percent. yeah so i have one final question you ready i am so i don't know where i came up with this question but it has worked for me if i was only to ask one question mm -hmm. to get to know somebody in that one question mm -hmm. by their response it would be this what message would you like to leave everyone based on your journey of your life? Give me a second. I want, to, I want it to come through me instead of from me. <clears throat> what, mas what message would I like would to leave you, people? Go ahead. Based on your journey of your life. Give me one sec. It's formulating. <laughs> okay. Love is an intention. Uh, explain. So many people wait for the circumstances and the conditions to be met for them to feel a sense of love. Um, they want everything to be aligned and proper and in order, but love is an intention. So if you want to change the direction of your life and you want to improve any of your relationships, when you shift and move forward and take action at, with love as, in essence, as the flashlight that leads you, then every relationship that you have, including the one with yourself, changes. Because that, love is not just about loving other people, it's about also loving yourself. That was beautiful. 
Thank you. Very Thanks. true. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for your time, PJ, for sharing your journey, your expertise, and how to be resilient and <laughs> being available that, to anyone who wants to know more about how to do that. Thank you so much. It's my honor, and Christine, thank you so much for the invitation. It's Absolutely. truly been an honor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to thank my studio sponsor, the Motivated Mind Group, your global creative agency located right here in downtown Chandler. If you have a story you want to share, know someone who has a story, or you're a nonprofit making a difference in your community, please email me to the address of stories at christinehotchkiss.com. Until next time, everyone, I wish you well and you take care. <laughs>